Hi there, I'm glad to welcome you to my channel, World of Stories. I have a lot of interesting life stories that I want to share with you. Enjoy listening. Pierce decided to come to work a bit earlier today finally. He got up early, got himself ready, and even had time for breakfast. However, he wasn't in the best mood as he headed to work. Spring had recently arrived. The sun's rays caressed his face, reminding him of a similar atmosphere somewhere on the warm shores of oceans and seas. It's a pity that on such a beautiful day, he had to work until sunset again, then habitually drink beer with colleagues, come home, and collapse into bed. His soul craved variety. Before he could properly lament, a sports car abruptly braked in front of him. Behind the wheel was a girl. Hey, handsome. Hop in. We need to talk, the girl playfully addressed Pierce. Pierce was surprised. Yesterday, he had spent the whole night trying to chat up at least one girl in the nightclub who would somewhat resemble her, the one behind the wheel, but to no avail. And here, such a cool girl was inviting him herself. Pierce didn't notice how he got lost in the beauty of the girl and froze in place. I'm talking to you, handsome. Can't you hear me? Come over, don't be afraid, the girl called out a second time. Pierce cautiously sat in the front seat next to the girl. Before he could close the door, the car swiftly took off, and they were speeding along the waterfront. The girl held Pierce's hand with one hand and periodically smiled at him. So, you were looking for me all night yesterday and couldn't find me, she asked. Yeah, not you. Not you exactly. I mean you, but among other girls. But I was looking for one who was as beautiful as you, Pierce replied, bewildered. Pierce was completely flustered. After a few minutes, the car pulled into an underground parking lot of one of the upscale residential complexes. The girl expertly parked and stopped in the middle of the parking lot. Then she nodded towards Pierce, indicating they had arrived. Pierce, still in a daze, got out of the car, while the girl was already waiting for the elevator at the other end of the parking lot. Hurry up, Pierce. I knew you were so shy, she said when Pierce ran up to her. Uh, where have we arrived? What's your name? Pierce tried to clarify the situation. Does it really matter to you, the girl replied. She pressed her body against his, and her hand slipped somewhere under the belt of his jeans. Pierce felt the intoxicating scent of her perfume and the fragile body in his arms. He was hopelessly losing his mind. When the elevator stopped, Pierce was already losing touch with reality. It doesn't really matter, he thought. The girl opened the door to one of the apartments with her key. Despite the early hour, the apartment was dimly lit. The door closed behind them. The girl immediately started stripping off her clothes, and the spellbound Pierce followed her. Until they found themselves in a bedroom with an unusually large bed. Then everything happened very chaotically. Pierce could only chase away the questions arising in his head. It didn't matter who this girl was. It didn't matter what was happening here, and it didn't matter how it would all end. It turns out, this is what it means to live in the moment, here and now. At least that's what some voice in him was saying. The sweet haze between the two bodies was interrupted by a loud knock on the door. Pierce was slightly startled, but the girl decided not to be distracted. However, the more they ignored the knock, the more persistent it became. Pierce couldn't bear the irritation and sighed heavily. At the same time, the girl's phone rang. She glanced at the screen and said to Pierce, Damn, it's my husband. If I don't open the door now, his security will break it down. I'll go to the bathroom. Act like you're bathing yourself. With that, she dashed out of the bedroom. At that moment, Pierce heard footsteps approaching. The front door opened, and several people stormed into the apartment. Pierce realized he had a couple of seconds left. Perhaps, in that time, he could only jump out of the window. He didn't have any other option. Without much thought, he gathered all his strength, took a short run, and threw himself out of the open window with all his body. In just a second, his body felt the swift impact with the hard and cold surface. And then Pierce finally woke up and realized that he had just fallen off the bed. He glanced around. 
reached for his phone, which was lying on the nightstand, and all his lifted spirits vanished. The clock showed that he was thirty minutes late for work. Pierce hastily jumped up. With one hand, he held the phone to call a taxi. With the other hand, he dressed in whatever he could find nearby. When he finally arrived at the office, he was greeted with the usual scene. Pierce, you're late again. The whole office has been waiting for half an hour, as if it's a party. Waiting for your majesty to grace us with your presence, his boss, Mrs. Elvira, sniped at him. Sorry, Mrs. Elvira, force majeure. Had to help grandma cross the road, Pierce replied sarcastically and hurriedly headed to the conference room. All the employees of the local TV channel were already gathered here, waiting for their irritable boss, Mrs. Elvira. For the next half day, the whole team would discuss their plans for the week. By this time, every employee already knew which program they would be preparing and on what topic. But in every company, there is a boss who must repeatedly discuss what the employees already know perfectly well, and it must never be called a simple waste of time. Today, Mrs. Elvira decided to unleash all her anger on Pierce. What do you have planned? Your talk show is rapidly losing ratings. The last episode was like watching grandmas in a gazebo. If it's the same this time, we'll have to cancel your show, and you'll have to find a new job, Mrs. Elvira declared. What was wrong with the last episode? The whole world is currently discussing the problem of low intelligence among young people. They've really stopped reading. Isn't that concerning to conscious citizens? Pierce asked. In reality, nobody cares, Pierce. There were no ratings for that episode at all. You need to reconsider your direction. Either you come up with something good next week, or you'll lose your spot. Mrs. Elvira said. Pierce pretended to carefully jot down all of Mrs. Elvira's brilliant advice. In reality, he was scribbling doodles in his daily planner. By the end of the meeting, Mrs. Elvira seemed to be feeling a bit better, having released all her anger. She turned to the most incompetent journalist of the TV company. Pierce. I've told you a hundred times, and I'll say it for the hundred and first time. Remember. People need spectacles, not boring long discussions about the abstract. People expect excitement, new emotions, and drive from us. To give them that, we need to find heroes from real life, not in libraries and scientific laboratories. Let's get to work. I still believe you can do it, she said, concluding her speech. Pierce spent the rest of the day aimlessly wandering through various offices. The meeting, which was supposed to unite the team, drained them all of energy. Every employee eagerly awaited the departure of this angry fury to attend to her own affairs or for a business lunch, so they could finally relax in the kitchen and blow off some steam. But it didn't happen. The unproductive day felt like three. Then Pierce opened his daily planner and began to jot down which shows people experience wild emotions and get a thrill from. There was only one option, and it was classic. It always saves all journalists and other individuals seeking public applause. Now all he had to do was find a hero. The next workday was even more unproductive than the previous one. Between tasks, Pierce browsed job vacancy websites but still held out hope that he would find a hero for his new talk show segment. He just had to think, and he really didn't want to. His savior came in the form of a call from a colleague in the printing department, who informed him about an interesting event happening today, eagerly awaited by journalists. For Pierce, it was a perfect opportunity to leave the office and spend his work time a bit more interestingly than in the office. Mrs. Elvira approved his initiative. Pierce waited for his colleague in the parking lot of the nearby shopping center. They were delayed. Pierce hummed to himself and gazed wistfully into the distance. Suddenly, he noticed an interesting sight. Behind the shopping center were several trash bins. Usually, homeless people loitered around there, but today, there were none to be seen. Instead, there was a child wandering around, about four or five years old. Judging by the tousled shoulder-length hair, it was a girl. She wore minimal clothing, a light tank top and old shorts. Pierce continued to observe. The girl initially tried to reach the edge of the trash bin to grab the full bags hanging there, but she couldn't. So she began digging through the bags lying on the ground near the bin. 
After a while, it seemed like she found something there. She started pulling her fine towards her mouth. Pierce, of course, lacked any experience in fatherhood or dealing with children in general, but what he saw horrified him. He got out of the car and shouted, Hey, kid. What are you putting in your mouth there? You can't do that. It's dirty. The girl glanced over and then continued doing her thing. Pierce approached her closely, sat down next to her, and saw that the bag contained food scraps, and they were clearly not fresh. You can't eat that. Do you understand me? Pierce asked. The girl stared silently at him. Are you hungry? Where's your mom? How did you end up here? Where do you live? Pierce asked. The girl pointed towards the shopping center. Pierce looked there and saw an old multi-story building. Apparently, the girl had slipped away from home unnoticed. Ah, uh. let's go home. Do you know how to get home? Pierce asked her. Pierce took the girl's hand. The girl obediently took his hand and walked with him. At that moment, a brilliant idea came to Pierce's mind. Just by leaving the office, here was the solution he desperately needed. The girl led Pierce to an apartment on the ground floor of the old building. The door was open. He knocked lightly, but no one responded from inside. So he went in. The smell of poverty hit his nose. It seemed like there was a sewage leak, but no, it was the smell from the kitchen. There was a pile of dishes in the sink, surrounded by flies. Food leftovers cluttered the table, and crumbs were scattered all over the floor. Pierce walked into the living room, where the TV was blaring. There, sprawled on the couch, a woman was fast asleep. Judging by the volume of her snoring, she was out cold. Pierce approached her and nudged her lightly. The woman turned over onto her other side. Woman. Hey. Wake up. Your child ran away, and you're sleeping, Pierce said. Pierce nudged the woman again. It was only on the third attempt that the woman opened her eyes and struggled to comprehend what was happening. When Pierce told her that he found the girl near the trash bins, the woman shrugged indifferently. Oh, she always does that. She eats scraps? Pierce asked. No. She runs away from home. She's only just learned to walk, and she's already heading out onto the street. What can you do? These times, this youth, the woman said, shrugging. This youth? But she's still a child. You should be looking after her. And it seems to me you've been drinking alcohol? Pierce asked, slightly outraged. No. What alcohol? I just have a drink occasionally to relieve stress. And what do you suggest I do? Is it easy for me, at my age, to take care of someone else's child? I'm human too. I get tired, the woman protested. Someone else's, you say? Whose child is this? Where's the girl's mother? Pierce asked. She's at work. This is my granddaughter. My daughter's at work, the woman said. Where does she work? Pierce inquired. She has an out-of-town job. Usually goes away for a week or two. Sometimes longer, the woman replied. What does your daughter do? Why didn't she enroll the child in daycare? Pierce asked. I don't understand. Are you a policeman, prosecutor, judge, or what? Why all these questions? The child has a mother, has a father. What are you doing here, bothering me, the woman snapped. If there are parents, why is the child unsupervised? The girl is hungry. She needs to be fed. Pierce exclaimed even more strongly. Well, since you understand that, then take her and feed her. There should be some soup in the pot in the fridge. If you're leaving, just make sure to close the door behind you, the woman said, yawned, and flopped back onto the bed. Pierce called his friend and warned him that he had unexpected business and would be delayed. Pierce went into the kitchen, opened the fridge, and peered inside. The soup in the pot didn't look very appetizing, and there was nothing else to eat. Pierce led the girl to the bathroom, but reaching the sink proved to be a challenge. 
crumbs and dirty laundry were scattered all over the floor. The girls seemed to have spilled water and cleaning solution again. With some effort, Pierce managed to help the girl wash her hands and face, which were smeared with dirt from the dumpster. Then, slowly, Pierce took the girl to the nearest store. They picked up a full bag of groceries. Some things the girl chose herself. There was household soap, packets of bags, insect repellent, and glass cleaner. All of this indicated that the girl hadn't had an easy life. She didn't even know what ordinary children's delights like chocolates and chips looked like. So she just grabbed whatever she could. Pierce picked up some children's treats for her himself. On the way back to the apartment with the drunk grandmother, Pierce realized that leaving the girl here was not safe. What's your name? Can you speak? Pierce asked. Ophelia, the girl replied softly. What's your mom's name? Pierce asked. This question puzzled the girl. Perhaps she was hearing the word dad for the first time. Pierce didn't torment the girl with questions. He tore a page from his notebook and began to write. For the safety of your child, she will stay with me for now. When you come home, contact me. Otherwise, I will inform the authorities to check on your fitness or take your child, Pierce wrote, then he added his address and phone number. He hoped that the girl's mother would come home from work in the evening and contact him, but in the evening, there was no call or knock on the door. Closer to nightfall, the girl began to cry and asked to go home. Pierce called his mom. He consulted with her on how to calm down a five-year-old child. When his mom heard the story, she was horrified, but she did offer some advice. Barely managing to put the little girl to sleep, Pierce sat in the kitchen and grabbed his head. How could he go to work tomorrow? You can't leave such an active and mobile little girl alone at home, and her mom, who knows where she's wandering around. Pierce consulted with his friends who have children, but they couldn't offer any helpful advice either. Seeing his hapless employee with a vagrant and a child in his arms, Miss Elvira was genuinely delighted. Pierce. I assume you understood my advice correctly? This is your new heroine, right? True. You need to put her on the air just like this. In these shabby clothes. All disheveled. That would be a good emotional response from the audience, she said. No, Miss Elvira. I think it's unethical, and besides, I found this girl by the dumpster. She has a grandmother, but she's hopeless. I'm waiting for her mother to come home from work so I can hand the child over to her, Pierce said. You're a foolish journalist, Pierce. You have no professional intuition. This is an excellent story to put up for public discussion. You have a chance to regain all the lost ratings from the past six months. So, when the girl's mother appears, talk to her. Let her tell us how she ended up in this life, Miss Elvira said. At first, Pierce was against it, but after some thought, he agreed with Miss Elvira's proposal. Indeed, the story was more than suitable for public discussion. However, until the girl's mother arrived, they could prepare some details. With these thoughts in mind, Pierce called his cameraman, then took the girl, and they went together to those dumpsters. Pierce pulled out several bags from the dumpster, scattered them on the ground, and left Ophelia among the trash. The girl couldn't understand what was happening and what was expected of her. Ophelia. Come on, check what's in the bags. Open them and see. Maybe there are toys or sweets in there. Come on. Repeat what you did yesterday, Pierce prompted. The cameraman filmed all of this in close-up. Now it didn't matter whether the girl's mother agreed to the broadcast or not. But the bait for the storyline of the new show was already there. Pierce received the long-awaited call only on the fourth day. Hello? You left a note that my daughter is with you. On what basis did you take her? I demand that you return her immediately, or I will report kidnapping to the police, a woman's voice sounded threatening. Hello? Before you report to the police, we can inform the Child Protection Services to check on you first. But let's not argue. Everything is fine with Ophelia. She's fed, dressed, shod, and safe. She's already beloved by the staff of one of the TV channels, and she lives there. Can we meet at my office? 
Pierce said. The woman puzzled over what was happening for a while, but in the end, agreed to come to Pierce's workplace. There she saw her daughter in a new beautiful dress, surrounded by a mountain of toys, playing enthusiastically in the employee lounge. All right, Ophelia. Get ready. We're leaving here quickly, she grumbled. Ophelia will go with you, but let's talk about this first, Pierce insisted. Desperate, the woman followed Pierce to his office. Let's get to the point. I see you need help and support. Where is the child's father? Pierce asked. That's none of your business, the mother grumbled. No, that's exactly our business. An innocent child is suffering. The girl can't complain to anyone or ask for help on her own. You're leaving her practically unsupervised. Your mother abuses alcohol, and she can't be responsible for your child. We want to help you. You should listen to us, not object. Pierce said. And how do you plan to help me? With advice? Morals? Perhaps you should keep them to yourself. Everyone knows how to live their own life. We've heard enough of that, the woman said. You're not alone in your problem. In the country, and indeed in the world, the issue of child protection is acute. We journalists prioritize covering this issue to awaken a sense of responsibility in adults. In short, I suggest you become the heroine of my talk show. We'll appeal to the sense of responsibility of your husband and boyfriend. Who do you have there? That is, the girl's father. You will have the opportunity to influence him, and at the same time, we will once again remind our society about this problem. It's a noble cause. Agree, Pierce insisted. The woman's tone changed now. She calmed down and began to actively consider Pierce's offer. In addition to everything, we will pay you a fee. It's a decent amount. All we need from you is your consent. My assistants will tell you which day and what time to come on air. Well, are we agreed? Pierce asked. Next, they only had to agree on the amount of the fee and the time of the talk show recording. Pierce put a checkmark in his daily planner. If he manages to shoot this show properly, he won't be fired. The prospect of exposing Robin to the whole world as a scoundrel who left pregnant Maria and never bothered about the fate of his daughter seemed appealing to Maria. Even though this channel broadcasted not to the entire country, but to a small town and its outskirts, Maria hoped that the conscience of this shameless man might finally awaken, and he would start helping with money occasionally. That was Maria's mindset. On the appointed day, she took Ophelia and went to the TV channel's office. She had prepared her speech in advance, a story about her brief romance with Robin, her subsequent demands, grievances, accusations, and everything else. In the studio audience, there were various people, including some quite well-known personalities. Pierce began by reading some statistics about abandoned children and single mothers, about their fates and problems. Then Maria and her daughter were invited to the studio. They were greeted with enthusiastic applause. Maria was given the floor, and she flawlessly delivered her prepared speech. Ophelia looked around with complete incomprehension. She felt very uncomfortable with so many eyes staring at her intently. In the end, Pierce engaged her in dialogue. Maria. We get the impression that not everything is as smooth as you portray it. You say you care about your daughter. Meanwhile, you leave her unsupervised for several days, and the girl is rummaging through dumpsters during that time. What do you think about your own responsibility? Pierce asked. Maria clearly didn't expect such a turn. She was promised that the discussion would focus on irresponsible fathers. But I have to work, as I already told you. What you're saying, that my daughter is wandering around trash cans, is untrue. She's under the reliable supervision of her grandmother, Maria said hesitantly. What do you say about these shots? Operator, please play the video we recently captured, Pierce said. On the big screen appeared a video of Ophelia indeed rummaging through garbage bags near the bins and seemingly searching for something there. She was dirty and lightly dressed. Maria was horrified at what she saw, as she had never witnessed such a sight before. This can't be. My mother always watches her, she exclaimed. 
Let's ask the girl herself. Ophelia, please tell us, do you recognize yourself in this video? Pierce addressed her. Yes. It's me. Ophelia replied timidly. You all heard that. In addition, this video was taken at the moment when we found Ophelia left to fend for herself. The mother claims it's untrue. What do you think about this? Pierce turned to the audience. She's lying. Shameless. And it's obvious she's lying. Judge her, take away the child, and put her up for adoption. What a shameless woman, shouts came from the audience. Maria was horrified but tried to keep herself together. Maria claims she left her daughter under her mother's supervision. But what does her mother think about this? Let's watch the next video, Pierce said. In the next video, the audience saw Maria's mother carelessly sleeping in bed in front of the TV, a pile of unwashed dishes in the kitchen, crumbs on the floor, leftovers on the table. Seeing herself in such an unfavorable light, Mrs. Sabrina clutched her heart and rushed into the studio without waiting for Pierce's invitation. Let me speak. This is all untrue. On that day, I fell ill. I felt unwell. It was just once. Why are you showing this to the whole world? The woman protested and asked for the microphone from Pierce, but Pierce remained unfazed. He again turned to the audience to hear their opinion. They're both shameless. What a disgrace. Lock them both up. No shame, no conscience. Poor child. The cries of the audience now sounded even louder. Only one person in the audience kept talking continuously and gesturing actively with his hands. He turned out to be either some lawyer or another clever specialist who took it upon himself to speak for everyone else. He was given the floor, and he finally said something logical. And where is the child's father? Obviously, two women alone can't handle taking care of a child. Clearly, what's needed here is male care, strong shoulders, and reliable support. So, I would like to address all irresponsible fathers, the man spoke loudly. By the way, about the father, Pierce interrupted him. We found the girl's father. He is a 32-year-old man named Robin, who works at one of our city's private companies. We managed to talk to him, and here's what he said. Please, show the video, Pierce said, and everyone looked at the big screen again. Who's the girl? No. I don't know her. The man in the video says, looking at a photo of Ophelia. But when shown a photo of Maria, he smirks and avoids the conversation. Unfortunately, the girl's father doesn't recognize her. And you know why. We were also curious about that. To find the answer to this question, we found Robin's friend, Julian. Please pay attention to Julian's version, Pierce said. Maria was horrified by what was happening. It turned out that everything was planned not as she imagined. Meanwhile, a certain Julian was speaking from the large studio screen. I know that my friend Robin was seeing this girl for some time. Her name seems to be Ariel or Adele. She's just a hooker from the corner. I think all the men in our city know about her, Julian said and laughed. Maria realized that she now had no chance of using the situation to her advantage. Yes. That's right. And what complaints do you have against me? Who are you to judge me, or any of you ready to give me money to support the child? Or who among you is ready to dress and feed me and the child? Maria exclaimed loudly. But nobody heard her as Pierce's microphone was directed at the audience. The loud cries of outrage now turned into a rumble. From the audience, almost everyone threw insults and accusations at Maria. Only Ophelia couldn't understand what was happening. Why were these adults shouting so loudly? So, what do you think? Julian was right. Maria really works as a prostitute. On the days when she supposedly goes to work. She accompanies clients to various events. As evidence, we present to you another video, Pierce announced. And then the audience saw Maria in the company of an older man, drinking and dancing at some nightclub. Then the operator follows her as at the end of the evening she leaves with this man. 
they drive to a hotel and there are several such shots of Maria with different men. So she's a prostitute. Everyone has the right to decide how they want to live. Her body, her business. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Then why did she give birth? Why did a loose girl have a child? Take the child away immediately. The cries intensified. Maria realized that now she would have to admit the whole truth, but that wasn't enough. The audience demanded explanations from her. Maria, what do you have to say for yourself? Do you really work as an escort? Pierce addressed her. Maria was caught in an emotional storm. She had heard such moralizing and accusations against herself many times before, but each time she reacted very emotionally to them. What business is it of yours where I work? I'm not asking for bread or money from any of you. Leave me alone. Maria was on the verge of breaking down. But Maria. We're talking about the fate of the child. Your job, let's say, is poorly compatible with motherhood. You're unable to take care of your daughter. What do you say to that? Someone from the audience asked. Actually, I didn't want to have this child. I found out about my pregnancy too late, when I told Robin about it. He said he would help, but then he disappeared from my life. I left the child because, Maria lost her train of thought. After that, Ophelia couldn't hear anything else. From all this show of high morals, responsibility, and morality, she only remembered her mother's words that she didn't want to have her and she remembered them for life. It turned out that people gathered out of concern for the child's fate, but none of them thought about the child themselves. What would the child feel about everything said here? This is what Ophelia would have to live with. After Maria's performance, she received her fee, which she quickly spent on her current expenses, but Ophelia's new life began. One day, when Maria was at home, Ophelia said, Mom, let's go to the zoo. All the kids in the yard go to zoos with their parents, ride on attractions. And I've never been to such places, said six-year-old Ophelia. What's so amazing about those zoos? They show everything on TV. Sit and watch, then you won't run out to play on the street, and I won't have to look for you in the yards, Maria said angrily, hastily getting ready for another outing wherever her client had just called her. Ophelia didn't ask her mother for anything else. She promised not to stay long today, but for the girl, it no longer made sense. Waiting for her mother to leave, she took a regular plastic bag from the kitchen, gathered her few belongings, put her only favorite doll with one arm missing in it, and headed for the exit. Grandma, as always after drinking, slept soundly. She didn't hear the front door open and her granddaughter leave again. Ophelia looked around and decided to go straight where the road led. The sidewalk led her to a major highway where cars were heading to the neighboring region and to other cities located thousands of kilometers away. Cars here passed relatively rarely. She stood by the roadside and started hitchhiking. No one wanted to stop. Ophelia grew tired of waiting. Then she took her small savings out of her pocket and held them out in her outstretched hand as she hitchhiked. One of the cars initially slowed down but still drove past the girl. The woman behind the wheel initially didn't pay attention to the lonely girl by the road, but after driving a bit, she became curious and concerned. So, she turned her car around and returned to where Ophelia was standing. Where are you going, girl? Are you lost? The woman asked. No, I'm not lost. Please take me to the orphanage. I have money. Here it is. I'll pay you, Ophelia said. What orphanage? Where are your parents? Do you have a mom? The woman asked in horror. I have a mom, but she didn't want to have me. She said it herself. I'm just causing her problems, the girl said. My goodness. What a horrific story. Get in the car, we'll figure something out, said the woman. Ophelia got into the car, and they set off. Before the woman could inquire further about the girl's life, she saw a horrifying sight ahead of them. The nearest stretch of road had just collapsed, leaving a thick layer of dust visible from a distance. There wasn't a soul around. Ophelia. Do you realize you just saved my life? 
The woman said, crossing herself at the sight. If she hadn't turned around and stopped for this girl, she would have been passing under the collapsed bridge right now. Ophelia didn't understand anything. She just asked, and what? Can't we go to the orphanage today? Oh, my dear. How can I send you to an orphanage? Today, no one can leave here anyway. Let's go to my place together now. You'll be my guest today. And then we'll figure out where you need to go, the woman said, turning her car around. An hour later, the woman brought Ophelia to her home. It turned out she had two young children, a cute dog, and a friendly husband at home. Hearing what had happened, everyone was horrified. Amber. This girl was sent to you by God himself. Her husband said. Definitely. I need to thank her. Said Amber. Ophelia, dear, tell me. What would you like as a gift? Ophelia didn't think long and said. I'd like to go to the zoo. I've never been there, she said. The zoo it is then. Victor, get the kids ready. We're going to the zoo today, said Amber. So Ophelia saw the zoo for the first time in her life. She enjoyed it so much that on the way back she forgot her resentment toward her mother. Mrs. Amber, I changed my mind about going to the orphanage. I'm afraid my mom will be angry. Take me home. It's not far from where we met, Ophelia said. Amber intended to meet Ophelia's mother and have a woman-to-woman -woman talk, to find out the reason why she was so indifferent to her daughter that the little girl decided to run away to the orphanage at the age of six. But unfortunately, that evening her mom hadn't returned from work yet, and her grandmother had just woken up from a drinking binge and left the house in search of her regular drinking buddies. Before leaving, Amber left her phone number for the little girl, teaching her how to dial the necessary digits. Then she left. She promised to always be available and ready to listen to Ophelia and help in any situation. Ophelia kept the note with the phone number, but she forgot to call the kind woman. Early on a weekend morning, the phone rang in the apartment. Maria wasn't home. Ophelia was alone, so she picked up the receiver and heard the voice of her recently acquired friend, Veronica. Hey, Ophelia. We need to meet urgently, she said in a rush. There was excitement in her voice. What happened? Do you have some problems again? Ophelia asked. No, everything's fine. I need to show you something urgently, Veronica replied. The friends met in the park an hour later. Veronica came with a newspaper in hand, deeply agitated. Ophelia, look. Here's a photo of one of those guys you saved me from a month ago. He turned out to be a serial killer. They've already arrested him and are looking for witnesses to his crimes. And also for others who have suffered, Veronica said, pointing at the photo in the newspaper. Ophelia looked at the photo and recognized it. Yes, indeed, about a month ago, she was walking home from practice when she saw several guys chasing a girl her age. One of them was harassing the girl, trying to lure her into a car. Ophelia then slowed her pace and watched to see what would happen next. The guy insisted on getting acquainted with the girl and almost forcibly began pulling her into the car. Without hesitation, Ophelia rushed to help. Her difficult childhood forced her to learn to stand up for herself from an early age. At the age of seven, Ophelia enrolled in martial arts classes, and today, at 15, she can easily handle three or four men who surpass her in physical abilities. Rescuing Veronica wasn't difficult for her. She first threw the persistent guy over her shoulder with one move, he turned out to be prepared. As soon as he pulled a knife out of his pocket, Ophelia knocked it out with a precise kick. By that time, his buddies had jumped out of the car and were ready to attack the fragile girl, but Ophelia managed to fend them off. When her strength was almost depleted, Veronica started screaming and calling for help. At the sound of her cries, the guys got scared, quickly got into the car, and drove off. Ophelia led the unfamiliar girl into the nearest entrance and calmed her down. That's how they met Veronica. It turned out that on that evening, Veronica decided to secretly let her driver go home, and she herself decided to take a walk after her vocal course. Veronica was infinitely grateful to the unknown girl for saving her. Now they were almost like friends. 
I've been terrified for two days now, I can't sleep. I had to honestly admit to my mom that I made a mistake by letting the driver go. Of course, she scolded me at first, but then she cried and calmed down. By the way, my parents urgently want to meet you. So, you're invited to our house this Saturday. And if anything, come with your parents. They're also interesting to mine, Veronica said. All right. I'll definitely come. It's just that I have difficulties with my parents, Ophelia said. What's wrong with them? Have they gone somewhere? Veronica was surprised, unaware of the other boundaries of life. No, it's not that. It's all complicated from the start. I'm an unwanted child to my mom. So, our relationship is very strained. I've never seen my dad and don't even know his name. People say that my mom herself doesn't know who fathered me. So, I don't even have a chance to find out anything about him, Ophelia said. On the appointed day, Ophelia came to visit her friend. She didn't even bother to call her mom. Ophelia already knows that her mom can speak contemptuously anywhere and provoke disapproval from others. It's happened more than once when Ophelia tries to convey to her mom the idea that she should think about others a bit. Her mom immediately shuts her daughter up, considering her not mature and smart enough to teach her mother. Veronica decided to show her friend her room first. It was a spacious separate room with a large attic on the second floor of the mansion. There was a spacious bed, her computer, lots of expensive equipment with names that Ophelia didn't know, her own separate bathroom with a water massage, a huge wardrobe filled with clothes. Veronica had everything. It's so beautiful here. Ophelia said. I wouldn't say that. I don't like it here at all. This house was designed for us by a designer. I absolutely dislike my room. My dad promised to give me a separate apartment when I turn 18. That's where I'll decorate according to my taste. We'll have parties there every weekend, Veronica whispered and giggled. Then they went down to the living room, where a big table was set. Veronica's parents turned out to be very pleasant and well-mannered people. Veronica's mother asked a few questions about Ophelia's parents, but she immediately noticed how the girl became uncomfortable talking about this topic. So, they quickly changed the subject and decided to just have fun. When the evening was over, these good people offered Ophelia to stay the night with Veronica, but she refused. Coming up with an excuse that she has training in the morning. In reality, Ophelia was worried that her grandmother wasn't home. She would probably come home drunk and might fall somewhere. Then Veronica's parents asked the driver to take Ophelia home. In the following days, Ophelia walked around impressed by the life of her new friend. She has everything one can dream of. Plus, a good family, good people. Those who say that all rich people are arrogant and their children are spoiled brats are not right. Nevertheless, it hurt Ophelia to think about this family. Every thought about these people and their lives in her head ends with the conclusion that she doesn't have all of this and never will. Ophelia eagerly awaited her graduation from school. She had always been a loner and detested the entire school life along with her classmates, but she excelled academically. Graduation promised her a new perspective. Finally leaving her home, attending university, concurrently getting a job, attending various developmental events, meeting lots of interesting public figures she's interested in. Overall, she had a goal, to become someone who doesn't suffer from the injustices of this world. By that time, her mother had settled down, found a permanent partner, and he was much more interesting to her than her unwanted daughter ever since she gave birth to her younger brother, Casper. She had no doubts about that. Casper was already a consciously awaited child. Therefore, the attitude towards him in the family was completely different. Casper was the king and god. All his wishes were law for the rest. Despite her jealousy and secret resentment towards her mother, Ophelia quickly learned to love her younger brother. How good it was that Maria's life had her stepfather, Casper. Ophelia would be calmer leaving this family forever. She wouldn't worry about them. In case of difficulties, she had Veronica and her parents. In three years of friendship, Ophelia only heard good words and kind intentions from these people. The first year of college life gave Ophelia her first great love. 
Thomas also turned out to be the son of wealthy parents. They study in the same group. Thomas was struggling academically. Ophelia helped him in every way. She was sure that there were real feelings between them, as she had no reason to doubt him. Three years flew by imperceptibly. By the beginning of the fourth year, Thomas changed his attitude towards Ophelia. If before he often said that soon he would introduce her to his parents, they would get married and be happy together. Now he began to avoid Ophelia. For several months, Ophelia tried to understand the reason until it surfaced on its own. The reason turned out to be another girl from the same group as Ophelia and Thomas. Her name was Amon. Beautiful, bright, bold, and somewhat unprincipled, she knew very well about Thomas and Ophelia's long-standing romance. But that didn't stop her from taking Thomas away right under Ophelia's nose. After a while, Thomas stopped avoiding Ophelia. He and Amon no longer hid their love. They constantly sat together in classes, came in the morning together, and left together after classes. Being cunning and deceitful, Eamon decided to finish off Ophelia with demonstrative public displays of affection. She would purposely sit on his lap. She would purposely kiss him passionately in front of the whole audience. Education became hell for Ophelia. Her friend Veronica saved her. Veronica intentionally came after her classes at the university to meet Ophelia, walk together, and distract her from self-destruction. Why is everyone treating me like this? Ophelia kept repeating. Everything's fine with you. You're just like everyone else. With your strengths and weaknesses, Veronica insisted. I think my weaknesses are significant. Especially when my own mother rejected me from the very beginning. How am I supposed to live with this? What's the point of my existence at all? Ophelia lamented. Veronica, we're friends. We have no secrets. We can allow each other to be honest. Tell me about my shortcomings. Maybe there's something I need to work on? Ophelia added. Veronica pondered for a moment. Honestly, you have too much distrust of the world, of people. Too much shyness. Sometimes you're aggressive for no reason. It's difficult for you to relax and let go of the moment. That's how I see it, Veronica said. It's all not by chance. I have no experience trusting someone, relying on someone. You talk about relaxing. But what is it like, anyway? I know that I feel and behave as if I'm sitting in a glass jar, but I can't do anything about it. I don't know how to get rid of this feeling and feel this world as my home. It's like I wasn't supposed to be in the script of this world, and by some mistake, I ended up here. I think all the troubles in my life stem from this, she said. You know what? I know this lady. My mom's friend recommended her. They went together to figure out some tangled issue. If you want, we can go see her. She's good with all sorts of paranormal stuff. Maybe she'll give us some direction to move in. Out of curiosity, Ophelia agreed. The friends didn't postpone this matter. They arrived at one of the apartments in an old multi-story building on the outskirts of the city. The old lady turned out to be blind. Ophelia expected to see a specially equipped room with magical symbolism, but the old lady's apartment was no different from an ordinary pensioner's dwelling. Well, what's bothering you, kiddo? Sit down. I knew it would be you coming to me today, the old lady said, surprising Ophelia from the threshold. The thing is, in my life, Ophelia tried to find the right words to describe all her problems. There's no need to explain. I already know everything. You're tormented by some heavy feeling that doesn't let you live, the old lady said. Ophelia nodded. What you believe in, it's not true. You believe in the bad, but you didn't become like this on your own. They worked on you back in your childhood. I see a crowd of people right in front of me. They're shouting something very unpleasant to you, but they're blind. Many are spiritually blind. They don't understand that nothing happens without God's plan. Every creature on earth has its own mission, and yours is huge, the old lady said. Now Ophelia was sincerely interested and listened attentively. I see your soul before it came into this world. It's very mature. 
different destinies are offered to it. They say to it, there's a simple life, with no special worries. You'll live it like one in a million. Such a life consists of an unpretentious routine. Wake up, run like a squirrel in a wheel, sleep, wake up again. Your soul didn't welcome such a life. They offer it another life, and your soul gladly agrees to it. They tell it that it won't be easy at first. You'll struggle a lot for yourself. In the end, victory over yourself is predicted for you. They promise you signs of support. You're already receiving them. You save people at every step just by your existence. That's the secondary meaning of your life. These are all signs for you to continue living and fighting. Listen to your heart, and it will lead you on the right path. When it's painful and unbearable, accept this pain with dignity. You'll have plenty of it, and then suddenly all the trials will end. You'll learn about it last. Suddenly everything will fall into place, and you'll understand everything yourself. But for now, gather strength and patience. There's a long way ahead. Said the old lady. Meanwhile, Ophelia was a bit disappointed that the old lady didn't say anything specific, but at least she received valuable advice, to live, endure, believe, and hope that everything will eventually end suddenly. As for saving people, she was already accustomed to it. If something didn't go according to her plan and strange events started happening. Then very soon it turned out that Ophelia was in the right place, and at the right time, to have a positive impact on someone's life. It was as if she possessed some secret power, but this power had never worked in Ophelia's favor. It saddened her, but then it was still too early to draw any conclusions. All the most exciting things were ahead, literally just around the corner. Meanwhile, seeing the sweet couple like Thomas and Eamon every day became increasingly unbearable. The last straw was Eamon's stunt when she approached Ophelia directly and said that she was old-fashioned in her clothes. These words crushed Ophelia. From that day on, she completely lost interest in studying. No matter how she tried to convince herself to endure for another year and a half, nothing worked out for her. She decided to drop out of school, but Veronica saved the situation. She advised, and personally helped Ophelia to arrange an academic leave. Just in these days, Ophelia's group was organizing a picnic. They planned a trip to the mountains for the upcoming weekend. Nothing foretold trouble. The noisy company stopped on a hill in dense forest at the foot of the mountain. The guys initially intended to hunt. They were well prepared. The girls set the table, someone played the guitar and sang. Thomas and Eamon, as usual, didn't leave each other for a minute. The realization that all this vile story now remained in the past gave Ophelia enough freedom in her behavior. She no longer felt like a victim. She was now indifferent to Thomas, to his new girlfriend with her constant unexpected attacks towards Ophelia, to all the other curious people in the group. Darling. We and the guys decided to go up the mountains and hunt there. Don't get bored here, Thomas said to Eamon in front of everyone, kissed her, and they disappeared behind the thick wild trees. After some time, one of the girls named Sophia complained that she was feeling bad from the alcohol she had drunk, but nobody in the company cared about her. Instead of helping her, the girlfriends insisted that Sophia have another shot of alcohol. After another shot, her condition worsened even more. Ophelia watched closely what was happening and worried about Sophia when the girlfriends insisted more and more on drinking further. Ophelia suggested to Sophia to take a break from the feast and go aside. Going into the bushes, Sophia washed her face with cold water and began to come to her senses. Ophelia, honestly, I don't want to go back to the clearing. The girls are already drunk, they don't accept a refusal, but I can't drink anymore, she said. I'm of the same opinion. Let's go for a walk instead, Ophelia suggested, and they headed upwards, towards the mountain. The way up turned out to be difficult, but the girls were curious about what kind of view would be revealed if they went just a little higher. So they passed a quite long distance without noticing it. The forest ended. Around were only huge boulders, a gentle rock, and somewhere far away snowy mountain peaks. Wow, how beautiful. But it's really hard to breathe here, Sophia exclaimed. Look down, everything is like the palm of your hand, and the summit seems within arm's reach, Sophia added. 
I wonder which way our boys went. What if they mistake us for trophies and shoot us, Ophelia said. There they are. Come here and look straight ahead, Sophia said, pointing her finger at the cliff opposite. Indeed, the guys were slowly and cautiously climbing the cliff, jumping from one boulder to another. The cliff wasn't high, but steep enough. Sophia, I can't climb anymore. Let's stop here, Ophelia said. I'm not feeling well again. It's really hard to breathe here. I'd rather go back, or it'll get worse, Sophia said. Her poor condition could be seen on her face. She really wasn't comfortable here. Ophelia, if you want, you can walk around here or go further by yourself, and I'll go back down, Sophia said, and with light jumps headed downwards. I'll climb higher and come back to you later, Ophelia shouted after her. Climbing a little higher, Ophelia found a piece of green meadow under an ancient tree. It was the perfect place to lay down on the green grass and enjoy the wild nature, which is exactly what she did. Getting comfortable, Ophelia decided to watch the boys. Where did they get to? They were much lower than the place where Ophelia was sitting. From the side, it seemed that the guys were hostages of the cliff. They were close to the steepest slope, but there was practically no way forward. Descending back was also problematic. In case of anything, the guys wouldn't even be able to help each other, as each of them was far enough apart from the others. It was clear that none of them had experienced climbing cliffs. Ophelia began to watch them with concern. Then one of them crept close to the other and reached out to pull the other forward, but at that moment something unexpectedly terrible happened. A gunshot sounded. And the second guy, who was reaching for the cliff after the first one, fell somewhere down. Then there was the deafening roar of all the other guys. Screams, commotion. Ophelia realized that something irreversible had happened. Ophelia jumped from her spot. She ran down to inform the girls and help the comrade who fell from the cliff. If climbing up was curious, then going down steep slopes turned out to be not so easy. Ophelia stumbled and rolled with her whole body to the nearest boulder, getting scratched by branches and sharp stones. The descent took her quite a long time and effort. When she finally reached the girls, she observed the following scene. It seemed that the girls didn't hear the gunshot and the guy's screams. They were playing the guitar, some of them lay on the grass, some were dancing. The ease of being and no worries. While Ophelia gathered her thoughts and found words. She heard the boys running towards them. Thomas was running ahead of everyone. He was pale, barely breathing, and shaking all over. Girls, quickly get up and gather around me, he said in a trembling voice. No, thanks. It's better if you come to us. We're so good here, the girls lazily replied. No time for jokes. Get up quickly. We lost Alex. Thomas said. What do you mean lost? Did he go somewhere and get lost? Shout for him. He'll climb out himself. Or maybe he's planned a date with Doris. Oh, Doris is here. Well, he's not little, he'll find his way himself. Stop yelling like that, one of the girls said loudly. Yes, it's not like that at all. Alex had a gun in his hands when he tried to hold on to the cliff, accidentally touched the trigger, and it went off. I was standing a step above him and saw everything with my own eyes. The bullet hit him straight. He fell from the cliff, Thomas said. Is he alive? Now the girls became alert. Yeah, how can anyone survive such a hit? Thomas said, sitting down on the grass and covering his head with his hands. In an instant, the festive mood and relaxation disappeared. Everyone sobered up in an instant. Someone panicked and started to fuss. Among the guys, Alan was the most resourceful. He called on everyone to stay calm. All right. The worst has already happened. As painful as it is to realize, Alex is now dead. We've already checked. His body is lying there under the cliff. Now we need to think about how we're going to save ourselves from being convicted. How are we going to prove that it wasn't any of us who shot Alex, but rather a tragic accident? That's what we need to think about. Alan said. 
I don't think anyone will believe that a person could accidentally shoot themselves. Anyway, we'll end up in court, someone added. We'd better call the police right now and confess, tell them everything as it is, someone else suggested. No police. Have you lost your mind? That's a surefire way to incriminate ourselves. No one will believe us, Thomas protested. The guys argued for quite a while. None of the options satisfied everyone. Then someone remembered a phrase from detective movies. No body, no case. The horror and fear of what had happened, coupled with an even greater fear of taking responsibility, led the guys to take an extremely cynical step. Leave the body somewhere along the road or under the bushes. Forget this horrible day, and tell Alex's parents that he didn't go with them at all that day. In the end, that's what they did. When Ophelia arrived at Veronica's new apartment, she found her friend not in the best mood. Moreover, Veronica was not pleased to see her friend at all. Oh, it's you. Come in. And what did you want, exactly? Veronica asked coldly. I was worried about you. How are you? Has Robin called? Ophelia asked. No, and he won't call, that's clear already. How did you decide that? Three days is a short time to draw conclusions, you should wait at least a month or two. By then, emotions will settle down, and you can talk calmly, Ophelia said. I don't believe in that anymore, Ophelia. Over the past three years, these are my fourth relationships that end so ridiculously. Did I enter into them with such intentions? What's my fault? I just wanted to love and be loved. But personal failures seem to be chasing me as if on purpose. It's a curse. I have no doubts about that. And what do you think about it? Veronica stared at Ophelia. I think you feel this way now because your wounds are still fresh. You and Robin had a fight just three days ago, and as for your other guys. You know yourself, each of them has their own separate dark story. It's just that you keep encountering such people for now. Maybe you don't yet know how to spot warning signs right at the beginning. We're young. We're only 22 years old. We have little life experience. So, for now, it's normal. There's a whole life ahead of us. There will be good people ahead. Don't torture yourself. I beg you, Ophelia tried to calm her friend down. It's not working. Oh, you know what? I went to see a woman. She told me the whole truth, Veronica said, wiping away tears. Veronica probably went to the witches again, who can attribute anything to a person in a state of stress. Ophelia didn't judge her. After all, she had behaved the same way herself not long ago. What did she tell you? Ophelia asked, wanting to give her friend as much opportunity to speak as possible. She said there's nothing wrong with me. She said all my guys came into my life with good intentions. But she says there's some miserable person around me who's stealing my energy. This person doesn't want things to go well for me like they do for everyone else. Because then he'll lose his source of nourishment. Can you imagine? Veronica said with undisguised anger in her voice. And who is this person? Ophelia asked. By all indications, she means you. Yes, her description fits you perfectly, Veronica said, almost shouting the last words. Ophelia froze. She couldn't believe her ears. In an instant, she searched her memory to find at least one thought against her friend Veronica. I think this woman has misled you. I don't even have any bad thoughts about you. If you don't believe me, let's go see her together. If she really sees me as your enemy, let her say it in front of me. I have a clear conscience towards you, Ophelia said, barely hiding her emotions. No. There's no need for that. I have no questions for her personally. She explained everything to me clearly, Veronica said. Ophelia realized that defending herself was pointless. She simply stood up silently and left her friend's apartment. Veronica saw it all. She didn't try to stop her friend. She didn't even say, goodbye.
to her, which means she completely believes the words of this woman, not her friend and their years of honest friendship. Kids, hurry up. By the time we get to the mountains, it will already be two to three hours, Mason urged his family. Ember. You're always fussing with your makeup. Enough of that. In the mountains, no one will see you, he said. Mason hurries his family to the planned Sunday picnic in the mountains. Finally, they all got into a large family SUV and, looking forward to an exciting vacation, headed for the mountains. The road is long. This family has a good tradition. In any boring situation, they turn on their favorite music, sing, and dance. They've been doing just that the whole way. When they were very close to the mountains, one of the kids lost patience from boredom, and the family decided to stop along the road. The kids decided to run and jump not far from the car. Mason stepped aside to smoke. Ember, who went behind the bushes to powder her nose, suddenly let out a piercing scream. Mason. Look. There's a person lying here. Mason dropped his cigarette and ran over. Indeed, along the road, under the bushes, lay a young man in stylish clothes. Mason bent over him and checked his pulse. He's very weak, but the man is alive. Without questions, it became clear that the man had been shot, and there was no one to provide medical help. Clear the back seat. Let these kids sit in the trunk, and we'll take the guy to the hospital, Mason said, lifting the young man from his seat. As Mason laid the young man on the back seat of his car, the man tried to make a weak sound. Hang in there, buddy. Everything will be okay, soon. We'll take you to the doctor now, and he'll help you, Mason said and quickly got behind the wheel. So instead of a picnic, this family had to deal with saving the student Alex, whom his friends left along the road out of fear. Ember and Mason were so worried about the young man that they couldn't leave him in the hospital and just drive away. While the medics were giving him first aid, Ember asked the doctor for the student's phone and called his parents. Fortunately, a few hours later, the doctor reported that the young man was okay. The gunshot wound is serious, but vital organs aren't affected. The guy will have to spend a few weeks in the hospital, and then he can go home. Alex's parents were shocked by the news. They had been looking for their son for six days, and there was no news from him. The last time they saw him, he was getting ready for a picnic with the student group. But his friends, as they had agreed among themselves, told his parents that Alex hadn't come that day. The parents believed their son's friends and began searching in other places. On the second day, they went to the police. The police quickly determined that Alex had actually been with his friends. After the investigator individually questioned all the students in the group, he had no doubts. Thomas became the main suspect in this case. Under this pretext, it was decided to keep him in isolation until the case was fully investigated. When Thomas's lawyer learned that Alex was alive, he hurried to inform his client. Your friend turned out to be alive. He was picked up by random passers-by and taken to the hospital. I visited him, talked to the doctor. He will be okay. He will live, but he's currently unable to give testimony. To absolve ourselves of full responsibility, we need to obtain testimony from witnesses. Did anyone see you climbing the cliff together? The lawyer asked Thomas once again. Yes. I think my ex-girlfriend Ophelia saw us, but that day was the last time she was with us. Later, I found out that she took a leave of absence from our group to distance herself. I just remembered that now. If you can find this girl and talk to her, she can confirm how things really were, Thomas said. The lawyer was also pleased that some positive lead was found in this case. He wrote down Ophelia's address and phone number. He promised Thomas that in the coming days, he would find this girl and talk to her himself. Thomas also had hope for a speedy release from prison. The lawyer came to the specified address and knocked on the door. It was opened by a middle-aged man with an angry face. Excuse me. Is Ophelia here? I need to see her urgently, he said. Oh, there's no one like that here. What do you mean, there isn't? She rented this apartment for the last four years, the lawyer asked. Oh, now I rent it with my family. We moved in a week ago. 
There's no Ophelia here, the man said and slammed the door shut in front of the lawyer. Several days later, the same door was knocked again. Maria was glad that she had finally reached the city and could rest a little from the usual family chores next to her daughter. The door was opened by the same middle-aged man with an angry face. Excuse me. Where's my Ophelia? Maria asked. Do I have to put up a sign for all of you on the entrance? There's no Ophelia here. I've been renting this apartment for two weeks now, the man got angry. How come? Where's my daughter then? Why didn't she tell me she was moving to another place? And do you know how to find her? Maria asked in an innocent tone. Woman. Are you crazy? How am I supposed to know where to find your daughter? Get out and don't bother us anymore, the man said and slammed the door shut again. Maria stepped out of the entrance, sat on a bench, and began to think. Who could she ask about her daughter's new place of residence? As it turned out, she didn't know any of her daughter's friends. Who was her daughter friends with in school? Who does she communicate with now as a student? Who does she trust with her secrets? All of this was completely unknown to the mother. After wandering around the city all day, she had to go back. Now she just had to wait for Ophelia to call home or write a letter. Veronica came out of the gym. She decided to take a walk around the city, leaving her sports car in the parking lot. She was stopped by a familiar voice. Veronica. Where are you rushing to? Wait, let's talk, get in the car. She turned around and saw her dear Robin next to her. It had been a short time and he had already managed to change his car. Otherwise, she would have noticed him from afar and become excited. Veronica silently sat in the front seat and only then remembered that she was actually upset with Robin. Forgive me. I overreacted when you said you were going to spend the night at the club without me. I got jealous, but it won't happen again. Let's forget everything and do everything as before, Robin said. No way. You don't get off that easy. I've been through so much during this time. Promise me that in the future, before accusing me of something, you'll ask me a lot of questions, and that way we can get to the truth. And the truth might be that we don't really have a reason for scandals, Veronica said, trying to show her indignation. I know that. It's true. There's no serious reason for conflict between us. Between us, there's only love and attraction. I understood that during this time. Let's forget everything, Robin agreed. So, where are we going? That's not all. I have a more serious conversation with you. Depending on its results, we'll see where to go, Robin said, becoming serious. Veronica was in an unfamiliar situation. Close your eyes and turn away, he said. Veronica turned away. Now turn back. Veronica turned around and saw a large box in front of her. It was just an ordinary one. Either from under a milk package or from under pasta. No glamour, velvet coating, or ribbons. I just rushed and took the first box I saw. Just open it, Robin said. Veronica opened the box and in the far corner saw a small velvet-covered casket. This isn't just another gift from me, Veronica. This is my invitation. I invite you into my life to continue it together with you by my side. Are you willing? Robin asked. With this, they came to the logical conclusion of their relationship at the first stage. The wedding was scheduled for the next month, and in the meantime, they had meeting each other's parents and other pleasant bustle. That same evening, going through the list of close people for the wedding in her head, Veronica realized how silly she was and what she had concocted about Ophelia. I need to go to her right away and apologize, she thought. Within an hour, she was knocking on a familiar door, which was opened by the same grim middle-aged man. Excuse me. Is Ophelia home? Veronica asked uncertainly. Oh, another one. What, was your Ophelia a merchant or something? Did she vanish into thin air and leave you all behind? How many times do I have to repeat that she moved out of here ages ago, the man said. You don't happen to know her new address. Fine. 
Sorry for bothering you, Veronica said, already turning away from the closed door. Veronica stepped out of the entrance, sat on a bench, and also realized that she didn't know anyone from her friend's close circle. Where could she look for her now? Veronica truly fell into despair. If only they had communicated normally, as before. Then Ophelia would have shown up one fine day, as always. But now, after Veronica acted so foolishly towards her, she doubted Ophelia would want to return to her. I know her. She's too sensitive for me to just forget the nightmare I told her, Veronica lamented to herself. Meanwhile, Ophelia woke up very early. Although she didn't need to. The gentle waves of the ocean constantly rocked the yacht. The first few days were difficult for her to get used to the oceanic lifestyle. The space is constantly swaying. When you step outside, there's wild wind. Sometimes there are waves crashing right against the cabin windows. Sometimes it's scary. Sometimes it's thrillingly interesting. Only in the mornings can you enjoy the silence of the ocean and the sunlight on the water's surface. Especially since most people are still asleep, and there are few people on the deck. From the first days, Ophelia loved this time. Now she lazily stretched and headed back to the deck, returning there by breakfast time. By then, her new friend Michael had been looking for her everywhere. Ophelia. Where did you disappear to? I worry every time you're not around. Let's go, have breakfast at the restaurant, and then I want to show you something, Michael said. They had breakfast. Today's program includes a stop at the port of one of the exotic countries. They have eight hours to explore the unfamiliar city and return. I'm a bit tired of all the excitement. Let's not go out to any city today, let's stay in our rooms, Ophelia suggested. Left alone, they again indulged in lively conversation, which could last for hours. Ophelia had never met someone so similar to her and so kindred in spirit. Ophelia. Tell me again, how did you end up in that place when I was almost robbed? We didn't discuss it then, Michael said. If you want to know everything in detail, it will be a very long story. Are you ready for that? What questions? You know I'm interested in everything related to you. We have plenty of time. We're in no hurry. Come on, tell me already, Michael said, handing his new interesting friend another cocktail. In those days, I was in a terrible depression. I haven't told you much about my childhood. I grew up feeling unwanted. It's not something I made up. When I was five, I overheard my mother regretting having me. She never really took care of me. When I grew up, our relationship didn't improve. They're still bad between us, Ophelia explained. You get depressed because of your relationship with your mom? Michael clarified. No. I've long come to terms with that. The problem is that I'm constantly searching for someone to replace my mom or dad, whom I've never seen. Another problem is that people aren't willing to be my mom or dad. They have their own lives, their own concerns, but I want some emotional warmth from them, simple devotion, a simple presence in my life when things get tough. My boyfriend Thomas and my friend Veronica were such people, but on one not-so-fine day, my relationships with them also cracked. That's when I lost faith in people and the meaning of my life altogether. The words of some old lady I heard many years ago helped me. Back then, I didn't fully understand what she meant. But she said that I'm needed in this world. She said that my mission extends beyond my own life to the lives of many others. I believed in those words, but life took a completely different turn. That's essentially all my sorrow. On that day, I deliberately went to the city waterfront to greet the morning and contemplate the meaning of life. I didn't even notice how I ended up near the bridge where cycling enthusiasts pass by, and then suddenly saw something suspicious. Those guys who were about to attack and rob you. They had prepared well beforehand. I could see it perfectly from the edge of the bridge where I was sitting. I've just saved many people many times before and knew what would happen next. So I immediately descended from the bridge and hurried to take you to the other side. As you noticed yourself, a completely different person who was heading in that direction ended up in the hands of the thugs. But seeing an old pensioner on a bicycle, the thugs quickly realized there was nothing to gain. They left him and ran away. 
So, everything ended well, Ophelia said. Wow. You truly are amazing. Michael said with a smile. And now, can I ask you a question? Ophelia asked. Well, of course. How did you end up in our small town and where do you get so many opportunities to travel the world so calmly? And to take me with you? Ophelia asked. If you ever want to, I'll take you to my country, and you'll see everything with your own eyes. My parents come from a famous dynasty that made furniture for the most famous people on the planet. They look like very simple people. They're always busy with their very simple work. They work with wood. My mom sews upholstery for furniture. I grew up in such a family. Thanks to this craft, our family earned a decent fortune. I also have my own furniture workshop, but specialists work there. I took a slightly different path from my parents. I graduated from business school in Europe, learned all the intricacies of business. In the end, in three years, I managed to set up the operation of my organization so that it functions perfectly without me. But I'm constantly in touch with them. My parents don't want that because they enjoy the process itself. I had a childhood dream, to see the whole world. So, when I was 30, I decided to sort out all my important business matters and then pursue my childhood dream. As you can see, I'm succeeding. Michael said. That's astonishing. I thought people only live with their problems and only suffer. Every time I help someone in a difficult situation, those people open my eyes to some new boundaries of life. You've just opened up the whole world for me, Ophelia said. Ophelia, do you have a childhood dream? Michael asked. Yes, I do. When I was a child, when I felt really bad, I dreamed of screaming loudly about my pain. As I got older, I realized that it was a desire to sing. But I still can't sing because my voice is suppressed by my inner demons. I can only sing to myself quietly, and the lyrics of my songs come straight from the heart, Ophelia said. Then let me make a gift for you. I know there's a vocal course for everyone on this yacht. We'll go there right away and sign you up. In three days, I want to hear your voice at full volume and hear your pain. That will be your beauty, Michael said. Nothing prevented them from turning their dream into reality right now. Casper came home from school and found his mother crying on the porch. Mom, what happened to you? Did someone hurt you? he asked. No. Nobody hurt me, son. Your sister Ophelia wrote a letter. I just read it. Something hit me emotionally, Maria said. Did she write something bad? Is she okay? What does she say? asked Casper. Just read it yourself, Maria handed the letter to Casper. Casper unfolded the large sheet of paper and began to read aloud. Dear Mommy. Forgive me for not getting in touch for so long. I don't know if you were looking for me or waiting for my call, but you're always in my thoughts and in my heart. I left town for a while. I'm fine. There are good people around me. I never told you that I've always been lucky with good people. They're not relatives, strangers. They usually appear in my life suddenly and bring something good with them, but not this time. I would like to write to you what I couldn't say for so many years. Our relationship was shattered from the day you were forced to say in public that I was an unwanted child to you. My childish soul took it too seriously. This phrase was my tragedy for many years. It prevented me from living. It prevented me from believing in people and trusting the world. But analyzing my short life path, I realized that life was persistently proving to me that I am a needed person in this world. Other people told me this, and even after that, I was offended that you didn't say these words to me. But now something important has happened in my life, and I decided to leave all these grievances in the past. Dear Mommy. Even if you didn't want to give birth to me. Know that it's not just like that. Perhaps, in this way, God saved you from a tragic mistake and wanted to turn your pain into joy. I know it was hard for you to raise me. I know your youth story and for many years blamed you for it, but I don't think so now. I'm not a judge in your life. I'm your daughter. Your part. Your copy. Forgive me for all our misunderstandings. 
I love you very much. I'm sure deep down you love me too, but some circumstances prevent you from admitting it. Take care of yourself, take care of my little brother. Say hello to my kind stepfather. Don't worry about me. I'm fine. Your daughter Ophelia. As Casper read the last lines, Maria burst into tears. She sat on the porch for a long time, remembering her relationship with her daughter. Two years have passed. Maria loves to go around the neighbors and tell them about her daughter's achievements. Just recently, she released a new song that has already become a hit and gathers millions of viewers. Maria wanted to immediately share this with her neighbor Nina. Nina, can you spare five minutes to listen to my daughter Ophelia's song urgently, and then you explain to me. Do you think nobody has ever sung about this before, or do others also think so? Just listen, she said and hurried to find the video on her phone that Casper uploaded yesterday. Oh, I've already heard this hit song by our Ophelia a hundred times. You're behind the times. Now it's my favorite song. It's constantly playing on my phone, Nina said. Really, your favorite song? Look at Ophelia, how talented she is, Maria smiled. You're asking about its uniqueness. Let me tell you. Before, I only listened to songs about, crazy love, dying without you, can't live without you, but Ophelia's is different. Just listen to what she's singing about. She says something like this. It's like you weren't born into this world by chance. You have your own mission. Just don't hide your soul from people, trust the world, and it will elevate you. Never believe the dark fantasies of other people or your own. She says that sometimes the world may sting you. But it's only so you can learn to withstand such stings. And she sings a lot about good people in the world. About how everyone holds a diamond in their soul. It's not a song, it's a masterpiece. Ophelia is simply a talent, Nina tells her. Then Maria goes to another neighbor and hears similar reviews. It's a pity my daughter is abroad. I wish she could come and visit us once. She must have concerts there one after another. Time is short. She remembers us sometimes. Meanwhile, Ophelia ended up today with Michael on the other side of the world. As usual, they were too lazy to go for a walk around the city, so they decided to stay in the room. Ophelia. Please tell me. What are you thinking about right now? What are your desires? Perhaps you've fallen for someone? Michael asks, lying on the nearby sofa. No, Michael. There's no love in my heart yet. I feel inspired. I still have so much to tell the world through my songs. That's why I'm fully immersed in my creativity, Ophelia replied. It's great that despite all those hardships, you managed to find your true self. I'm happy for you, whatever happens. Always remember, you have me. Michael said. Can I ask a personal question? Ophelia asked. Go ahead. A year ago, you confessed your love to me. I replied then that I couldn't deceive you. Because I love you not as a man, but as a friend and brother. Were you offended? What did you think then? Ophelia asked. No, of course not. How could I be offended by the truth? It never mattered to me whether you loved me back or not. I confess to you not to claim you. But to give you even more inspiration, strength, and desire to live. I think it's wonderful when someone loves you. Let my feelings be like your capital or resource. You can always rely on them. I'm grateful to you for being honest with me. It's better than if you had deceived me or decided to take advantage of my feelings, but you don't. I really appreciate you for that. Michael said. You know what? I don't rule out the possibility that I might already be in love. But it's only because of the intense creative process, I don't quite feel those feelings yet. And also, because you're always there. No matter what. But if I manage to figure it out, and you turn out to be the object of my love, then be ready to arrange our first night of love somewhere in the jungle, as we're used to, Ophelia said. Having seen the world, achieved realization, and forgotten all her heartaches, Ophelia once felt homesick for her hometown. 
Michael happily agreed to accompany her on the trip. First, she went to her mother. Maria was overjoyed. Mom, Michael and I are only here for a short time, but I have a proposal for you, Ophelia said. What do you want to propose, honey? Maria asked. Casper is finishing school soon. He needs to get into a good university. And you and your husband have long deserved a break. I suggest all of you move to the city. If you want, live in a well-appointed apartment. If you prefer, live in a house on the outskirts. That way, it will be easier for me to fly to you more often and visit. And then, honestly, your husband should see a narcologist. He's a very good person, but it's time to think about his health. If he's been drinking so much since he was young, what will happen to him in old age? Ophelia said. Well, your stepfather is unlikely to agree to move. He's lived here all his life. This is his familiar circle. He won't want to leave here. And if we leave him behind, he'll be completely lost here, Maria replied. Ophelia didn't insist. The next day, she and Michael were planning to go to the lake on the outskirts of the city, where Ophelia had spent a lot of time alone. When they were getting ready to leave, her mother asked. Ophelia, is it serious with this guy, it seems? I think he's ready to marry you today. Don't miss out on him, her mother said. Mom. What kind of advice is that? Let me tell you the whole truth, and try to believe in it. Michael and I are not engaged. We're just friends for now. Yes, he confessed his love to me, but at that time, I didn't love him. So, I didn't lie. Yes, he's rich and handsome, but I have no desire to claim him and show him off to everyone so they all envy me. We're interested in developing together. We enjoy discussing various ideas together. We're not sleeping together, as a man and a woman. That will happen if I ever love him and invite him to it myself. But for now, it's just like that, Ophelia said. Maria couldn't imagine how such a relationship between a man and a woman could be. But she didn't ask any more questions. After spending a few days as guests, Ophelia and Michael left her hometown. Returning to the capital, Ophelia stayed in one of the hotels. In this city, she hardly had any friends or acquaintances left. But as she walks the streets, she's recognized as a popular singer, and people try to take pictures with her. Ophelia remembered that she once studied at one of the universities in this city. She decided to visit her university and inquire whether she could somehow legalize her four years of studying abroad or not. The visit to the university surprised her not with academic questions but with personal news. Her former teacher greeted Ophelia quite warmly. Lilia congratulated Ophelia on her new achievements, expressed her pride in her student, then invited her to her office and started a different conversation. Ophelia, I have a huge favor to ask you. You must hear me out. We know that at one time you disappeared suddenly and no one could find you. Unpleasant events have occurred since then. You surely remember your classmates named Alex and Thomas. Both of them faced major troubles after your ill-fated trip to the mountains, Lilia began to tell Ophelia. Ophelia shuddered and began to recall those dreadful days when horrors and dramas of her life unfolded before her eyes. By the way, it's a pity that such a tragedy befell good guys. I hope Alex's parents were able to come to terms with it, Ophelia said softly, sighing heavily. So, you don't have the full picture? Asked Lilia in surprise. She shook her head and widened her eyes. Lilia continued her story. The thing is, Alex survived. They found him in the forest along the road. They took him to the hospital. Granted, it all happened a few days later, but apparently, the guy is as tough as nails. He lay in the hospital for a long time, but he managed to pull through. It's a shame that he lost some skills. For example, he can't speak due to brain injury to certain areas. By that time, Thomas had already been put behind bars, suspected of attempted murder. The lawyer ran around town for a long time, looking for witnesses to what happened. Your classmates confirmed that there was no reason for such a conflict between Thomas and Alex. 
The lawyer came here and asked about you because only your testimony could help him change the course of the investigation and free Thomas, Lilia said. So, what does that mean? Is Thomas still in prison? Ophelia gasped. As far as I know, yes. The lawyer couldn't provide enough witness material in court to defend him. They sentenced him to either 15 or 18 years. Alex himself could have changed the course of the case, but he doesn't speak and can't even write on paper. His parents are just glad he's alive at all, Lilia said. Ophelia found it hard to breathe. She forgot about academic questions, wrote down the details of Thomas's lawyer, and hastily left the university. A month passed. The criminal case against Thomas was reopened, and a retrial was held, resulting in all charges against Thomas being dropped. Ophelia personally stayed in town to testify in court and tell the true version of what happened. As a result, all the details of the criminal case fell into place, and Thomas finally walked free. A few days later, somehow Thomas found Ophelia and persistently asked to talk to her. Ophelia herself had been waiting for this conversation. Thomas. Please forgive me. I just didn't know the case had taken such a turn. At that time, I didn't have the strength to think about others. I only dreamed of getting as far away from you and Eamon as possible. By the way, say hi to her. If I had known you were jailed, I wouldn't have avoided giving testimony, Ophelia said. Are you serious right now? How could you not think about it when such a tragedy unfolded before your eyes and a person nearly died? How could you forget about it when two lives were breaking apart before your eyes? Ophelia, don't lie. I know your true intentions. I know you deliberately ran away to get revenge on me for our failed relationship. You became jealous when I became friends with Eamon and dreamed of revenge, and now the perfect circumstances have arisen. I'm not here to complain about the three years I spent in prison. Prison only made me stronger. I wanted to remind you that you were the one to blame for our breakup. You had no reason to seek revenge on me. You should have been mad at yourself, Thomas shouted at her. Ophelia couldn't find anything to say. She had no desire to dredge up the past and now delve into the details of those relationships. She wanted to turn around and leave, but Thomas wouldn't allow it. The argument on the street lasted long enough. Ophelia couldn't bear such pressure and cried right there on the street. It seemed to only infuriate Thomas even more. He couldn't stop his accusations. Ophelia had apologized multiple times, but it didn't help at all. At that moment, somewhere across town, Michael remembered his beloved and decided to return to the hotel. When he got out of the taxi, he heard shouts and the noise of arguing people nearby. He didn't immediately pay attention to them. But when he recognized a familiar voice, he looked closely and was horrified. Ophelia was being held hostage by some guy, and he was tormenting her right on the street. Michael rushed to help. Seeing another man standing up for the fragile girl, Thomas calmed down. Dude, it's not cool to yell at a girl. You could have had a calm conversation, but now disappear right now or we'll report you to the police, said Michael. Thomas instantly snapped out of his fit of uncontrollable aggression and returned to reality. He thought there was no one to defend this fragile girl and that he could unleash all his dark sides on her. But then, for the first time, he met a worthy resistance, and it stopped him. Ophelia, how did you end up in such trouble? You always help everyone else, and now you find yourself being held hostage by a psycho. It's all my fault. I shouldn't have left you alone. Michael said, fussing over her. It was for the best. All these years, I had some questions about my past relationship with this guy. And just now, I realized that it was all for the best. I was lucky that he once left me for another girl, and yes, I was doubly lucky to meet you. By the way, do you still love me? Are you still willing to spend the rest of your life with me? Ophelia asked. There's no question about it. My feelings haven't changed, said Michael. But inside me, everything has turned upside down and fallen into place. I realized that you are truly worthy of my love and devotion, and everything else was just a misunderstanding and a mistake of youth. Let's never part ways. 
Ophelia said, sitting in the hotel room, greedily drinking water with trembling hands. Michael silently sat down next to her and hugged her. Indeed, the seriousness of his intentions and his loyalty were beyond doubt. Ophelia was convinced of this throughout the rest of her happy life.